Well, it really is good to be here again. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching. And um, I trust that God will bless us. I want to go again to a very familiar passage in the Bible, not this time to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, but if you want to a picture of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found in the book of Exodus and it's the Passover scene. Exodus chapter 12. Let me read a few verses and then I want to speak about it. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbour next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And then there are further instructions. And then verse 12, we read, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, please do read the rest of Exodus chapter 12, and uh, I think we all know this to be a very thrilling passage. So the Israelites had been in Egypt for, what, 400 years. You remember how they'd got there through Joseph and the brothers eventually coming down to get grain and then eventually the brothers bringing Jacob and them settling and then a new Pharaoh arose and, uh, well, now the people have been crying out to God for deliverance. Moses was raised up and uh, there were various plagues sent to seek to persuade and put pressure on the Pharaoh, but he just hardened his heart further and further against God. And eventually there was this terrible plague of the firstborn of every Egyptian family dying from the family in the prison to the family in the palace. They all died. But God said to the Israelites, they were to take a little lamb. Now, I, I know tiny bit about farming, not very much, but my youngest son, when he was 10, uh, of his own accord, he, he, he rented a field and he used to have goats and chickens and, uh, and lambs. And I have to say, lambs are very sweet, very cute. Eventually he had to get rid of the, the, um, the field and we never did dare tell him, but I'm afraid the goats were sold to an Indian takeaway. But anyway, he doesn't know that to this day. But there's something lovely, something cute, something very, very delightful uh, about a lamb and it was to be part of the household for for four days from the 10th day of the first month to the 14th day but then on the 14th day of the first month the lamb was to be taken and its blood was to be shed it was to be put in a bowl and then eventually a little branch a bushy sort of branch called a hyssop was to be taken used like a paintbrush and the blood was to be sprinkled on the doorposts of 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 of, of the of the houses where the Israelites lived and then God said I'm going to go over the land. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. I was once preaching on this and I was talking about the angel of death passing over the land and somebody came up to me at the door of the church afterwards and said, Roger, it never mentions an angel of death. And I looked at it carefully and I thought, he's right, it doesn't. It's the Lord who goes over the land. But he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So there had to be the blood of the lamb there were promises from God, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, but there had to be an act of faith. Now keep those three points in your mind because I want you to imagine now that you were the eldest, the firstborn in an Israelite family and you had heard your father explain everything that was going to happen and they were going to be leaving Egypt, going towards the promised land and um, God was going to come over the land and smite the, the eldest but there'll be blood on the doorposts and I want to ask you, when you went to bed that night, would you feel safe? Would you be able to sleep? Would you, would you be turning one way, turning another way, thinking, oh dear, I hope, I, hope, I hope the blood is noticed? Do you know, you could be more certain that night that you would sleep soundly and well and wake up the next morning than you could be any other night because of the blood of the Lamb, the promise of God, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, 
and that act of faith, believing God and putting the blood there. Well, the next morning, as we know, there was a wail throughout all the land of Egypt, crying, weeping, mourning, and eventually Pharaoh said to Moses and Aaron and the people, just go, just, just leave. And so they left. And we have more dramatic happenings, don't we, as the Bible drama unfolds. When we face death, can we face with similar confidence? Now that is a big question. I spent yesterday evening in a hospital in Leeds visiting just a very, very elderly lady who probably is near the end of her life. Can, can she face with confidence? Last year, my sister-in-law, Down syndrome sister-in-law, 49 years of age, died. And I remember going through to the little ward where her body was, she just a few moments ago died, and taking a hold of this now slightly cold hand and thinking, hmm, Barbara, are you at home with the Lord Jesus Christ now? And I believe she, she, she was and she is. But can we face death with confidence? Yes, we can. Because of the blood of the Lamb, because the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, who died to take away the sin of the world, because of him, there is forgiveness and he removes the sting of death, which is sin, and he says he'll take us through life's journey, he'll take us through death, and he will present us faultless before our Father who's in heaven. Because of Jesus dying and shedding his precious blood, in Acts chapter 20, it's even called the blood of God, because his blood poured out onto this earth as he carried on himself the weight of the world's sin, we can be certain that all will be well when we die because that which would condemn us, Jesus has taken on the cross. And you remember the Apostle Paul wrote and said, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But we can be certain as well that all will be well when we die, not only because of the blood of the Lamb, but because of the promises of God. And, and there are so many of them, aren't there, in the Bible? The Bible talk, calls them exceeding great and precious promises. It's, it's a great phrase. And things like whoever believes will be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In a sense, it couldn't be simpler. But we have to say, all right, there's nothing I can do. It's not by works of righteousness that I've done, but it's according to God's mercy that he saved me. So I'm going to trust myself, cast myself entirely upon the Lord Jesus. Jesus, you've promised that if I repent and believe, I will be saved. Lord, that's exactly what I'm doing. And there has to be that specific, definite act of faith for me, I was converted when I was 15. In fact, it was August 25th, 1965, and I was on holiday in the Lebanon. My mother was brought up there, and uh, it was up in the mountains of the Lebanon, sitting on a, a log where there was a clearing in the woods where they used to have barbecues, and my uncle sat and opened up the Bible and explained how Jesus loved me, how he died, how he'd risen from the dead, how I needed to trust him as my Lord and Savior. And I asked Christ to become mine. And oh, I have never looked back on that moment. It was a sort of hinge which changed the whole direction of my life. I didn't feel emotionally any different, but I was different. And it began to show because I had a new desire to read the Bible, to pray, to grow as a Christian, to lift the Lord Jesus and to enjoy him. And this has worked for thousands of years that men and women have simply come to God and said, God, I don't deserve anything from you. And I suppose in the end, I deserve death. And yet, not because of any merit in myself, you have loved me and you've come to reach out and to rescue me. Thank you that Jesus died for me. Thank you that he rose from the dead. Thank you that I have your promises, Lord. I'm putting my faith in you. Now, I want you to turn over, will you, in your mind's eye, in the pages of Scripture, and I want you to go to a little book tucked away near the end of the New Testament called 2 Timothy. The Apostle Paul is writing to his young friend Timothy. Paul is in prison in Rome. He, he's, he's had a glorious life, really. God took hold of him and used him as a sort of chosen vessel to spread the gospel message throughout the, the nations. He suffered so much, and in the end... Probably he died in Rome. He was incarcerated there. And I want you to imagine that we get permission to visit this now elderly man. And, and we see the, the prison guards and we say, look, we want to see this man, Paul. And 
Well, if you want him, he's deep down in a dungeon, but you, you can take a flaming torch if you want and you can go, but he's there. He hasn't had many visitors recently, but anyway, you can go. And, and you take this flaming torch and you go down these, these stone steps and it gets darker and damper and, and eventually you come to, I don't know, maybe a, a, an oak door and the, the guard opens it and says, he's in there. And you go in and, oh, it's horrible, absolutely horrible. And, and you hold this flaming torch, which is giving the light, near to the face of an old man. And uh, he looks up. And yes, maybe it is silver grey hair. I don't know. I mustn't read too much into it. And, and yes, it's, it's an old man's face. But there's radiance there. It's not fear. It's not anxiety. And you say, Paul, you're in this terrible situation. How is it that you can look so radiant, so full of joy in this situation? And do you know what he does? He replies and says, because the time of my departure is at hand. You say, it's time of your departure? What do you mean by that? And, uh, well, death has been done away with. Well, well how is that? Well, on the road to Damascus years ago, I met with the living Lord Jesus. I trusted in his blood, the blood of the Lamb. I believed the promises of God. And yes, there was my act of faith. The time of my departure is at hand and soon he's going to be taken and probably led up the Apian Way and there used as a flaming torch in the gardens of Nero. But death has been trampled underfoot because of what Jesus has accomplished. Let me end with a little story. I found it, it, it's not in the Bible, I found it actually in a, a little booklet by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher. And it's one of those legends that's gone round about a family that was alive at the time of the Passover and the, the Exodus. And father had explained to the whole family that they were going to be leaving and they needed the blood and uh, on, on the doorposts and um, we need to we need to get ready all of us have a good long sleep and it was a big family and then get ready for the start of the long journey tomorrow the the youngest the little girl she was only about five just could not sleep and she said started kept waking up and going across to her father and shaking him say daddy daddy papa um I'm worried about my oldest brother. You know, maybe, maybe he will die at midnight. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they won't see the blood. Maybe he'll be seen as the firstborn. And, and he kept assuring the little girl, look, all is well, don't worry. God has made his promises. We've got the blood of the lamb and we've made our act of faith. But this happened time and again. And eventually, just before midnight, I've no idea how they knew that. They certainly didn't have watches in those days. But just before midnight, again, she was so anxious, she went across and shook and woke her father. Daddy, Daddy, are you sure everything will be all right with my oldest brother? And he said, of course he will. Are you sure there's enough blood on the door? Yes, of course. Look, come with me. And he took her hand and he clambered over the sleeping bodies and he went to the front door and unbolted it and took his daughter and said, Now look, look, there was no blood. Quickly he dropped her hand and the legend said he ran back to the table and there was the bowl and the hyssop and the blood. And, and in the preparation, they'd done everything except the thing that was the most important thing of all. And he quickly got the hyssop and got the blood and the bowl and sprinkled just in the nick of time the blood. The legend said, of course, that it was God that kept prompting the little girl to, to wake up and uh, pester her father. But could I encourage every one of us to check and check and check again that we are, as it were, under the blood, that we are trusting in the fact that Jesus loved us and died for us and, and his blood was poured out on the cross that our sins might be forgiven can I urge us all to check that we are relying on the promises of God, not our own works, that we have definitely made our act of faith when we've said, Lord Jesus, please be my Lord, my Saviour, now and forever.